Thank you, Tracy. We ask you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. As we look at the most powerful word in any language, what would this word be? It's a word you can't get married without somebody saying it. You can't get that desired raise you want. When you go into the boss and ask for a raise, he or she needs to say this word. It's what you want an officer to say when he pulls you over for speeding or running through a stop sign and you ask him to give you a warning rather than a ticket. You can't go to heaven without saying this word. In fact, you can't have a relationship with God without saying this word in one form or another. It is found more than 200 times in our Bible, specifically this word, and in other ways. It's a word we ought to find easy to say when God speaks into our heart. And it is the word, yes. Yes is a very powerful word. When somebody proposes marriage, whether it's on a Hallmark movie <laughs> or real life, somebody is going to say, yes. Yes, I'll marry you. You want that police officer to say, yes, I will give you a warning rather than a ticket. Just be careful. Drive safely. One of the neatest yes moments in the Bible and there are many, is found here in John chapter 11. Now, when you look at this passage, the situation that precedes this reading this morning is the time that Lazarus has died. And Jesus enters into the town of Bethany where Martha, Mary, and Lazarus lived. So Lazarus has been dead for four days, and in that culture, I mean, we would be able to relate to this, but in that culture, they believed it was possible to come back from the dead prior to four days, but after four days, no, no hope. And so Jesus intentionally waits to come to Bethany to perform this miracle of bringing back Lazarus from the dead. And when he arrives in town, Martha is none too happy with him. In fact, you look at verse 21, John eleven twenty one. 21. Martha said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So what's Martha saying? This is on you. This is your fault. If you had have been here, my brother would not have died. If you had have been here, he'd still be with us. Well, Jesus then engages her in a conversation. Look at what we find here, verse 22. But now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes. Yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. Yes is a very powerful word. We're going to talk about that this morning. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, as we come to you, we thank you so much for the songs now resonating in our ears and our hearts, and now the word of God in our heart. About that time that Martha said, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I pray, Father, everybody in this house has had a time in their life prior to this moment that they've said, yes, Lord, 
Yes, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yes, I know that I'm lost and need to be saved. Yes, God, I want to be saved. I pray, Father, for those who are joining us this morning by way of YouTube, that folks there have had a yes time in their life. For those who listen to this later on, by way of our website or on a CD or in some way, God, you'll bring them to a point of yes in their life if they've not already done so. So I pray you bless our time together, please, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yes is a very powerful word, so let's, uh, let's just give it a try. Many times when we say the word yes, we use our own voice. So let's, let's give that a try. Do you love the Lord? I'm not sure. I, oh. Do you love the Lord? Yes. Good, okay. Are you ready to go to heaven? Yes. Do you want Jesus to come back today? Yes. Are you ready for a new pastor? No. Oh. <laughs> I thought I might catch you on that one. Okay. Well, when we say yes, we often use our own voice, but also our loved one. Our loved ones, we love to hear their voice, and we love it when they say yes. You ask them a question, you're hoping for a positive, a yes response, and when you get it, then you're happy. But now I do, you have a voice and your loved ones have a voice. Did you know that stars have a voice? The Bible tells us in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Their sound has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. Stars have a voice. Well, we know God has a voice. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and he said, let there be light and there was light. God has a powerful voice. Jesus has a voice. Jesus has a voice that only his sheep can hear. Jesus actually said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. We ought to get used to hearing Jesus speak into our heart. Now, not with these ears. He may not speak. I've only known a couple of people in my lifetime who've actually said and I believe them that they actually heard God speak into their ears most time he speaks into our heart the Holy Spirit has a voice I love those words that Jesus shared in John 16 where he said to the disciples this is just hours before he's going to be crucified Jesus said I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now however when he the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Holy Spirit has a voice. We also see this in Paul's writing in Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit speaks into our hearts. The Bible has a voice. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Bible has a voice. Well, God is always speaking to us in one way or another. He speaks to us through the Word, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, speaks to us in nature, might speak to us through our spouse, God speaks to us in a lot of different ways. Now, as an exercise this morning, does everybody know what a concordance is? Everybody pretty much know what it is? Most Bibles have a concordance, but it's a small one. This is a concordance. This is an exhaustive, what they call an exhaustive concordance. In fact, this particular book is the very first book I bought after giving my life to Christ and becoming a student of Scripture. A guy I was working with talked about a strong concordance, and he told me what it was. I said, Let me, I want that. He said, I got one. I'll sell it to you. I think I gave 10 bucks for it. I don't know. what might not have been that much. But in this strong concordance, most, not all, but most of the words of the Bible are in here alphabetically listed. 
Now, not words like a and the and of and and, words like that, but important words. And the, and the great use of a concordance is if you're studying something like fear or anger or faith or whatever it might be, you can go into the strongest concordance. Now, some of you do this electronically, but you kind of lose the significance of how many verses there are that deal with certain topics. So you can go look up, look up that topic, and again, they're listed in here alphabetically, and just read. That may not give you the full verse, but it'll give you enough of the verse to know what it's being said. A strong concordance is a great way to study the Word of God and, and to know and have God speak into your heart. The truth is, God is always speaking to our heart one way or another, and God is always with us. He's with us in spirit. He's with us in truth. He's with us in the Word. He's always with us. He's around us everywhere we go. We find this in so many different places of Scripture. Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. From the moment you gave your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. And He's been with you every step of the way. Wherever you go, He's with you. Sometimes we don't like to be reminded of that. But it's true. Jesus told us about this in Acts 1.8. This is prior to the Holy Spirit coming to indwell people. He tells the disciples, he tells the disciples, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Well, we don't have to wait any longer. He comes the moment we give our lives to Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 28, I will be, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. In Hebrews 13.5. We find the Lord saying and writing, the, the Hebrew writer writes these words, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now sometimes it feels like he has left us. But he says, I'll never leave you, so we've got to take him at his word. And sometimes there are those quiet pauses in life. And he causes us to kind of work through some of the things that we're working through. Another exercise I want to ask you to consider doing for the next 40 days. I want to encourage you to ask God to speak into your heart. Through all the noise and all the confusion of the world, I want to ask Him, I want to ask you to ask Him to speak into your heart. Now, if I counted correctly, that takes us up to June 2nd. And those of you that are listening to this some other time, you can just mark 40 days out. And ask God to speak into your heart. And as you ask Him to speak into your heart, as you talk to Him and ask Him, I want to encourage you to pray to Him. One of the neatest, simplest verses in the Bible, it's one word longer than the shortest verse in the Bible. The shortest one is, Jesus wept. The next shortest is in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Pastor, how do I do that? Pray as you want to. Pray as you need to. Pray as you are prompted to pray for someone. Pray with others as you have opportunity. Pray with family. Pray with friends. Pray when people are in need. Pray when people are sad. Pray when people are celebrating. Pray when people need to make a decision. Pray with them. Pray for strangers. Pray for neighbors. Pray for people whom God places in your path. And as you pray for them, ask God, do you want me to talk to them? Is this a person that you're leading me to talk to? When God speaks into your heart, he always speaks in love. Because as the Bible said, God is love. The very essence of God is love. Now, even when He is rebuking us, even when He is convicting us, He's still doing it in love. Because He wants to have a fellowship with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. And he wants that, that relationship, that fellowship to be vibrant and strong. He speaks to us in love. There are different ways to say yes. One is, as we've already practiced, with our own voice. We just say yes. 
Another way is to say the word amen. When we say amen, that's just another way of saying yes, I agree with that. The dictionary definition of amen is a solemn ratification or hearty approval. Sounds kind of sterile, doesn't it? It just means to say that you agree with what is being said. Several months ago now, I heard a gentleman pray. And he was in Washington, D.C. when he prayed. And he ended his prayer by saying, a woman. Now, I guess he thought he was being politically correct or inclusive. But what he did was he actually just revealed his lack of understanding of what amen means. It has nothing to do with gender. It means I agree with that. I approve that. I'm with that. Whether it's in church or somewhere else. You might even say amen every now and then watching television. Because you agree with something that's gone on. So let's practice that one. Can we say that one? Let's say that one together. Amen. One more time. Amen. Now, some preachers I know, they have to have the amen. I've been around guys that uh, when they preach... If you don't amen, they'll remind you. That was a good place to have said an amen right there. They'll, they'll beg for them. You know, they'll, they'll reprimand you for not saying amen at the right time. Now, those of you that attend here, been here for a while, you know I don't require your amens. In fact, you're going to get the full truckload, whether it's 10 points, 27 points, or however, you're going to get the full truckload whether, whether you get an amen or not. You know, it's just going to happen. But amen's a good way to affirm that you agree with what's being said. So, as the Lord leads, let them fly. Another, <laughs> amen. <laughs> another way to say amen is with body language. Or another way to say yes is with body language. Sometimes we say yes, we're just nodding our head. Well, when we nod our head on the telephone, that doesn't work out very well because they can't tell that you're nodding your head. But sometimes we use other kinds of body language. Several years ago, I had the occasion to be at the Tree of Life Baptist Church in Gary, Indiana. Now, if you've never been to the church, you can probably imagine the makeup of the Tree of Life Baptist Church in Gary, Indiana. It is primarily composed of many of our darker-skinned brothers and sisters in Christ. My first time to be there in that church, and I guess they still do it today, they said amen. But another way they communicated with the pastor that they're with him is they would stand up. Now, they don't go anywhere. They just stand up. Now, this first time this happened, I thought, what is this? Is this a revolt? Is this, a, is this an objection? Are we getting ready to have some kind of riot? Or what is this? But it's their way of saying, yes, preacher, I'm with you. And that may not, they might stand there for a while. Well, he's making some kind of a point. They'll just stand up, and then they'll sit down. And they might stand up again. That, that's a way of them saying, I'm with you. Yes, I agree with that. And they might, you know, give him the old fist pump or whatever, just to say, I'm with you on that. It's another way of saying yes or amen. 23 times in the Bible, Jesus called people to follow him. And he was always looking for a yes response. Whether it was the actual word yes, or whether it was just their action, like Matthew, when he got up and left the tax office and followed him. That was Matthew's way of saying yes. There was one particular occasion, maybe more, where a guy responded to the Lord by saying, no, not now. And the idea was, no, not now, but maybe later. He actually went on to say, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Now, I think that was more involved there than him just saying, I need to go tell my wife and my kids where I'm going so they won't be looking for me. I think there's a little more to that. I think he was saying, no, i got people in my house after they leave, maybe, maybe later. No, not now. Jesus actually said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. 
Well, sometimes saying no is the right way to respond. We can't say yes all the time. When someone is tempting us to do something wrong, tempting us to sin, no then is the right response. Several years ago at another church, another situation, another city far, far away from here, on one particular day I went shopping with Pat. Now I've gone shopping with her since that time, but this, this is one occasion. And you know, it's, it, I don't mind shopping with Pat, but you know, guys, can I get amen here? It's just awkward to go shopping with your wife, is it not? Is it awkward? I mean, we just don't know where to stand, do we? I mean, where do I stand? Where do I look? You know, if you look in the wrong direction, you're going to see something you ought not see. And as soon as you see it, you look away. And then there's a woman pointing. Yep, yeah, I saw you. I <laughs> caught you. Caught you looking where you should not see, where you should not be looking. Well, I was with her in this store. And God is my witness. I was not trying to listen. But there were two women a couple of racks over. And they were talking about their pastor and talking about their church. And they weren't quiet about it. It's one of those situations, you've been in a situation like this, haven't you? and Pat and I are in a situation like this. We're sitting in a booth in a restaurant, and we're thinking, do I need to be involved in this conversation behind me? It's like, like they want everybody in the store to know what they're... Well, these ladies were talking, and they were talking about their pastor, and it was none too good. And I felt embarrassed. I felt sorry for the guy. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know where they went to church, and I felt sorry for him. Felt the need to pray for him right then. Obviously, I haven't forgotten about that. We were in that Parks Belk store in Johnson City, Tennessee, and these two ladies talking about their pastor. I haven't forgotten it. Let me give you some tips here. Don't talk about your pastor. At least don't talk about him where other people can hear. Don't gossip. You know, it takes two people to gossip. One person can't gossip. It takes two people, at least two. It takes a talker and a hearer, a listener. Next time you're in a situation like that, someone decides they need to say something about somebody, you could just say, no. No, I don't want to go there. Now, they won't like it because they'll have something they'll want to say and they'll be embarrassed that you said no, but I want to encourage you to say no. And if you can't find the courage to say that or if they still keep on talking, remember this. I have this in my office. I learned this many years ago. If people talk about other people in front of you, they will talk about you in front of other people. Another tip. Don't talk negatively about your church and your pastor in front of your kids. Do your kids a favor. Don't talk negatively about the church or the pastor in front of them. They will remember that. They will not forget that. I was a grown man when I heard those two women in that Parks Belk store talking about their pastor. I still have, unless I develop Alzheimer's and dementia, I guess I'll never forget. I don't know what they said. I can't remember the details of what they said. I just remember the event. If you talk about your pastor or your church in front of your kids, I'm not saying any of you do this, but if you do this, it will have a negative impact on them. Here's what will happen. They will tend to think all pastors and all churches are just like that. And when they get older and can live out on their own, what are they going to say? I don't have to go to church. I don't have to listen to a preacher because they're all rotten, scumbags, low lives, you know, whatever word is used. They only work two hours a week anyway, so I mean, like, I know I'm not perfect, I know I'm capable of making mistakes, but don't talk negatively about your pastor in front of your kids. I don't have any proof that what I'm about to say is true, but I think what's going to happen one day, 
when people stand before the Lord, and we all will, Jesus is going to say to some of these people, why'd you give up on me? Why'd you give up on the church? Some of those folks are going to say, my parents. My parents talked about the church. My parents talked about the preacher. And I just decided when I got old enough, I wasn't going to go to church. I say, Pastor, what, what do I do if I'd done that? If I, I would encourage you to have a meeting with them. Call them up. Say, can we talk? There's something I need to apologize for. Counselors will tell this, this has been well documented. One of the things that most kids never hear their parents say, I was wrong. I made a mistake. Could you forgive me? Just remember that just because something is true, you don't have to say it. You could be gracious and give him the benefit of the doubt. So someday, when you have a password you don't like, don't talk negatively about him. He may not be the best preacher. He may not be the best teacher. He may not visit you in the hospital. He may not call you up on the telephone. But he's your pastor. Speak well of him. Another way to say no, another good place to say no, is when the devil is leading you down a wrong path. Say no to him. If you've never given your life to Christ, and the devil is taking you further and further away from God, have the courage to say no to him and yes to God. Say no to the terrible place he's leading you. Say no to his negative direction and say yes to Jesus. One of the most vivid pictures in the Bible of people saying yes to God and no to their past is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. You don't have to go there, just if you want to jot that one down. Where Paul talked about how the Thessalonians turned to God from idols to serve the living God. What a yes moment. They just finally decided, I'm, I'm going in the wrong direction. These idols are taking me nowhere. They're not leading me down a path of life. I'm saying no. I'm saying yes to God. John Avant is a name you may or may not know. He has been well used around our convention and around Christendom, and he just is a great man of God. He's pastored and served as an evangelist in different situations. He led a tremendous evangelistic movement in, at Southwestern Seminary, not while I was there. It was after I was gone, but God used him in a great way to cause a revival to sweep through the Fort Worth area. But John Avan and his wife Donna had been asked to serve in another capacity, another situation, to lead the pastorate and to lead another organization. And it was one of those situations, he, he wanted to do it, but yet he didn't want to do it. You know what I mean? He, 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 wanted, he wanted to be right in the center of God's will, and it seemed like this, this new leadership direction was not where God would be leading, because he'd always pastored. And so John and Donna got away to their favorite beach spot. They were beach people and just decided they to get away from the hustle and bustle of life and, and just spend some time with the Lord and, and just see if they could just get some clear thinking. Because they wanted to say yes, but they didn't want to do something that was not of God. So they've been at this beach location for a couple of days, and one morning John gets up and Donna's still asleep, and rather than waking her up, he just decides to leave her a note. He gets on his walking shorts, and he goes out on the beach to take a walk. And it's early in the morning, but yet it's, it's light. I mean, there are other people out there walking as well, but he's walking, and there are people out in front of him, behind him, and he's, he's, they're far enough away he can still walk and, and praise God and talk to God, just talk out loud to him. And John, as he's walking, he notices a man quite a ways up the beach from him, he staggers at one point, and then he just falls to the sand. Well, John runs up to him, and other people gather around him, and somebody dials 911 on their cell phone, and, and the paramedics are called, and it's obvious the man is in distress. He's having a heart attack. 
And the paramedics tried to help him, but there was no help. He died right there on the beach. And John Avant was just overwhelmed with the emotion of the moment. Watching this man go through this distress, people trying to help him, yet there was no help. And he said he just ran. He just decided just, he had to run just to get the emotion and the energy and just to, he just ran. He said, I, I guess I ran about a mile. And just crying out to God and praying and talking to God and just pouring out my heart. He said at one point he stopped at a pier and he just sat down on the sand there at that pier and just continued on his praying and lamenting and, and singing. And, and when he stopped... What John didn't know is on the other side of the pier was an elderly woman who had been listening to all this. And when he finished, she stepped out from around that pier and she said, have you been singing to the King of Kings? He said, yes, I have. John said, then she shared these words. It sounded like words of an angel. He has been with you everywhere you have been. And he'll be with you wherever you are about to go. Today, you watched a man die who could not be revived. But there are people everywhere who can be revived. John thanked her for her words. He left, went back to the condo, told his wife about the man, about the woman, and they called that organization up and said, yes, we believe God's leading us to come and lead the organization. Yes is a very powerful answer. When we say yes to God, we are never alone. The Bible says he's promised to leave us and never forsake us. That's why we're building kingdom relationships for the glory of God here. That's why we're reaching out to people. There are people who need to be revived. There are people who need to be saved. There are people who have other kinds of needs. Building kingdom relationships is really not all that easy. It's people working with people, trying to encourage people to get right with God. And that's not always easy to do, but it's important work. And sometimes the rewards are not this side of heaven. Sometimes they are eternal rewards. Sometimes the people that you will reach for Christ, you will never be there when they actually give their life to Christ. But you'll see them in heaven. And you'll say to yourself, how'd you get here? Because it didn't seem like your impact made any difference. The consequence of saying yes. What are the consequences of saying yes? Sometimes the consequence of saying yes is saying no to something else. Saying no to something that is maybe captivating your mind, your time, your attention, whatever. It may mean saying no to a cell phone. These cell phones with their ringing and with their tweeting, it's like they're saying, answer me, answer me, you've got to deal with me. Sometimes to say yes to God, we have to say no to something else. Maybe it's saying no to a hobby. I, I love doing woodworking. I was out in the garage almost all day yesterday, just plunking around out there in the garage. Sometimes you've got to say no to a hobby and let it go for a day or two so you can say yes to God. Sometimes we have to say no to the urgent things. We have a track in the back in the foyer called The Tyranny of the Urgent. If you've never read that, you ought to read it. Because so many times it's the urgent things that grab our attention and we set aside the important things. But the urgent things, like the cell phone ringing, or like that hobby, i got to finish this project, calls for our attention. Another quote from John A. Vent. In an age when you can lie on your sofa and watch great preaching as long as you want, Find any kind of biblical instruction while alone in your living room and have 5,000 friends through social media without actually ever spending any time with them. You will have to actively choose a supportive community. 
You have to actually say no to the couch and yes to God. No to the comfort and yes to getting out there building kingdom relationships. There are times when any one of us can be negative. Some of us were born in a negative mood. Some of us were born in a negative family. I've shared with you about some of my family I grew up in and the negativity that I remembered as a child. We live in a negative world. The power of the negative is so strong, many times it overcomes our desire to do what's right because of the negative. Think about what could happen if we made a commitment to say no to the negatives in the world and yes to God. And we found it easy to say yes to God. In a church that I know a lot about, there was a lady in that church who acquired the name of Negative Nellie. She acquired this name because she opposed everything the church did. She opposed the pastor, previous pastor. She opposed, she opposed committees. It didn't really matter what was going on. She opposed it. She was negative Nelly. Well, she was always there at church. In this particular church, they had a spring and a fall revival, and the pastor invited a, an evangelist to come in and preach the spring revival. And God used that evangelist to speak into negative Nellie's heart. The pastor had tried to help her. He was, he was unsuccessful. Some of the deacons of the church had tried to help her. They couldn't help her. Some of the ladies of the church tried to help her. No, nobody could reach her, but God used this evangelist to speak into negative Nellie's heart. And one night in that service, I don't know what the preacher was preaching. I wasn't there. He spoke into her heart. And she was rattled by what she heard. When everybody stood up at the end of the service for the invitation, she remained seated. Well, in true to form, people looking around probably thought, well, she's just being defiant. Everybody else standing up. Negative Nelly said, but she was moved by what God had said to her heart. When the people left, she went out the door. She thought about that message all the way home. As she were prepared for bed, she thought about that message. When she got up the next morning, she thought about that message. And sometime throughout the day, she had a come to Jesus meeting. And God just did a work in her heart. Well, that night, she was back in church. She was always at church. Sitting in her usual spot. And the preacher preached. Again, I don't know what he preached. But when the invitation was extended, she stood up. And she walked down front. Now, in this particular church, at this particular time, the pastor of that church was a lover of three, to, three by five cards. I can relate. I love three by five cards. But he had three by five cards all over the communion table and had put some markers and pins there where people, he would encourage people just to come at any time in the service, even while the preacher's preaching. If, it, if God's leading you to, to make a decision, Come and put it on that card. You got somebody you want, to pre, want to pray, us to pray for? Put their name on that card and just put it face down. Well, Negative Nellie went to the communion table and she grabbed one of those cards, one of those three by five cards, and she, she picked that card up and picked up a marker and she wrote something on that card. And then she sat down. And just before she sat down, she went to the pastor and said, Pastor, I'd like to ask you a favor. Could I say something to the church tonight? Now, this is negative Nellie. She's not had much good to say about anything. But he just sensed there was something different about her this night, and so he said, sure. The invitation continued. The evangelist turned the service over the pastor. The pastor said, one of our sisters has something she wants to say. And she got up, and she faced the audience. She said, you know me. And I know you. And I know about my nickname. I know my nickname is Negative Nelly. But I want to tell you, God's done something in my heart. And I'm a different person today. 
I'm a different person tonight. She said, I've opposed everything you all have tried to do. I've opposed the pastor. I've opposed the church. I've opposed anything and everything. But tonight, I'm changing. And she grabbed that card and went to the communion table, grabbed that card and said, my answer is yes. From now on, whatever it all, whatever you all want to do, my answer is yes. When the finance team comes with the finance budget for the next year, the budget for next year, my vote's going to be yes. I don't even know what it's going to look like. But I'm voting yes. When the youth want to go on a mission trip or church trip somewhere and they need some money, I want to be one of the first to contribute. When the ladies have a Bible study, I want to be one of the first ladies. I may not be the first lady, but I want to be one of the first ladies. To sign up. I want to be a part of what God's doing. And from now on, my answer is going to be yes. And with that, she sat down. Well, kind of like right now, the church was shocked. Is this a trick? Is this... Is the other shoe about to drop? You're what? What it? The pastor didn't know what to do. How do you follow that? And finally, he slips into preacher mode and says, "Well, are there any other decisions?" And one by one, at different places in the congregation, people stood up, and they came down, and they took a marker and a card and put their yes on the table. By the time Pat and I went to this church, all those cards were gone. Negative Nelly was gone. She had gone on to be with the Lord. But every now and then, either in a staff meeting or somebody in a message would bring up the night Negative Nelly put her yes on the table. Saying yes to God is always the right thing. Saying no to God often comes with consequences. Remember the Tower of Babel. No, God, we don't want to scatter. No, God, we don't want to go where you want us to go. We want to go where we want to go. Saying yes to God is always the right answer. I want to ask you to grab that card that I asked you to, that communication card I asked you to fill out earlier. And this may only apply to a few, but is there anything God might be saying into your heart tonight, right now, today? As every head is bowed, keep your eyes open if you need to. Pray if there's nothing to write down on the card. Think about what it would be like if people would just say yes to God. So many times we say, God, I'll say yes when I know all the factors involved, when I know all the details involved. I need more information. Could it be that we could be like negative Nelly and say, yes, God. Whatever it is you're calling me to do, I say yes. If God is speaking to your heart, feel free to communicate that. If it's a private decision that nobody needs else to know about it, that's fine. Just keep it to yourself. There's a song that's been ringing in my heart this week. We're going to sing it in just a moment. We're going to sing it a cappella. Words are going to be on the screen. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, as we come to you right now, I thank you so much for the powerful word, yes. And even though we may not all agree that it is the most powerful word, it certainly is a powerful one. No is a powerful word. But Father, I pray that we would have the courage to say yes to you. If there's anybody here today never given their life to Christ, I pray they would say yes Yes, I want to be saved. Somebody in the parking lot, somebody on YouTube, somebody listening, yes, 
Yes, I want to say yes to God. I want to be saved. Father, lead and guide us in these days, in this day, that we'll always respond to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, there are many other times in our life we're going to be called to say yes. There's this song, we used to sing it. I think you can sing it with me. Let's do this one together, shall we? Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom thee. Surrender your all today. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. He drew me closer to his side. I sought his will to know. And in that will I now abide. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. My heart, my life, my all I bring to Christ who loves me so. He is my master, Lord, and King. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Let's stand, shall we? Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. God bless you all. Turn those cards, if you would. You can put them on the communion table. You can put them in the wooden box in the back. Hand it to me, whatever. I'd love to read, the, read through those. But may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about a prophet who encouraged people to say yes. God bless you all. See you then.